Akinthostiga is seen as part of widespread evolutionary radiation in the late Devonian period, starting with purely aquatic fin tetrapodomorphs, with their successors showing increased air breathing capability and related adaptions to the jaws and gills, as well as more muscular neck allowing freer movement of the head than fish have, and use of the fins to raise the body of the fish. These features are displayed by the earlier Chictalic, which like Ichthyostiga showed signs of greater abilities to move around on land, but is thought to have been primarily aquatic. Acanthostiga was primarily an aquatic animal descended from fish that never left aquatic environment, and that the specializations of the tetrapod lineage were exaptations, features which would later be useful for terrestrial life, even if they originated for a different purpose. Ventastega has helped further research on the fish tetrapod transition, the event during the Devonian when digit bearing tetrapods evolved from finned, fish ancestors. Research on rates of character changes in tetrapods have shown that there were high rates of character changes in the Devonian, which led to the conflicting hypotheses of either the tetrapods had few major changes that occurred during the Devonian or had many small but rapid morphology changes. Its brain case as a mixture of fish-like and tetrapod-like characteristics, indicating that changes in the brain case during the fish tetrapod transition occurred through a series of many small changes instead of one large change. Ichthyostiga's massive ribcage was made up of overlapping ribs and the animal possessed a stronger skeletal structure, a largely fish-like spine, and forelimbs apparently powerful enough to pull the body from the water. These anatomical modifications may have evolved to handle the lack of buoyancy experienced on land. The hind limbs were smaller than the forelimbs and unlikely to have borne full weight in an adult, while the broad, overlapping ribs would have inhibited side-to-side -side movements. The forelimbs had the required range of movement to push the body up and forward, probably allowing the animal to drag itself across flat land by synchronous crutching movements. Spathocephalus was part of a group of amphibian-like animals called the Baphetoids, a lineage that weren't quite true tetrapods themselves but were still very closely related to them. Living in Scotland this one-meter-long stem tetrapod had an incredibly unusual head compared to its relatives, wide and flat, almost square in shape, with its jaws lined with hundreds of tiny chisel-like teeth. Crassigerinus was an early tetrapod from the early Carboniferous period, known from ancient coal swamps of Scotland. It had an elongated streamlined body with tiny vestigial-looking forelimbs and a pelvis that wasn't well connected to its spine, features that suggest it had re-evolved a fully aquatic lifestyle at a time when its other early tetrapod relatives were specializing more and more for life on land. Its mouth had a very wide gape and a strong bite, and it may have occupied an ecological role similar to that of modern crocodilians, lurking in wait to ambush passing prey. The shape of the skull and the fact that the feet face forward rather than outward indicate that Poderpes was well adapted to land life. It is currently the earliest known fully terrestrial animal although the structure of the ear shows that its hearing was still much more functional underwater than on land, and may have spent much of its time in the water and could have hunted there. Terminerpatin was probably a very early reptilomorph, closer related to amniotes than to lysamphibians. Its most surprising feature was its proportionally large feet with especially elongated fourth toes, which would have helped to extend its stride length for energy-efficient terrestrial locomotion and to stabilize its movement on unstable surfaces, a much more advanced amniote-like arrangement than expected in such an early reptilomorph, and convergently similar to to the foot shapes of some modern lizards. Known from the late Permian of Western Russia, Kroniosuchus was one of the larger Kroniosuchians. It had a wide row of butterfly-shaped interlocking bony plates along its back, the forward edge of each one overlapping the one directly in front of it. 
Similar to the osteoderm seen in Disorophid temnus bondyls, this armor would have both provided protection against larger predators while also stiffening its body for more efficient terrestrial locomotion. Archeria was a medium-sized aquatic predator, with an elongated body and tail. The limbs were proportionally small but well-developed, connected to robust limb girdles. Unlike most embolomeres, it had many small chisel-shaped teeth instead of large fangs. Its anatomy is well known compared to most embolomeres, as it is known from multiple complete skeletons discovered in 1939. Folagerpatin was one of the largest carboniferous tetrapods, at 4.6 meters in length. It may have been a predator, lying in wait for prey in much the same way as a modern crocodile. It was better at hunting in the water, but it might have also been able to grab a snack on land. It was a lightly built animal, weighing around 560 kilograms. Semuria was a highly terrestrial amphibian with well-developed muscular limbs. It's the best known of the Samuriamorphs, a group usually considered to be close relatives of amniotes, although some studies have suggested they might be a much more distant evolutionary offshoot, potentially even placing them outside of the true tetrapods. While it was highly reptile-like in appearance it had an amphibian mode of reproduction, fossils of aquatic larval Samuriamorphs have been found bearing external gill structures. It may also have displayed sexual dimorphism, males seem to have had thicker skulls, perhaps using them to headbutt each other Egg when competing for mates. In the shadows. Like this carnivorous amphibian. But he's too small to- Discosaurisids were long thought to be known from larval or neotenic forms, and three ontogenetic stages had been distinguished. However, more recent studies concluded that some subadult, Probably terrestrial specimens were known, so the case for Neotini in this taxon is not as well supported as once thought. The body was covered with rounded scales with concentric rings, and a well-preserved lateral line system has been described. Among its primitive features, Diadex has a large otic notch with an ossified tympanum. At the same time, its teeth show advanced specializations for an herbivorous diet that are not found in any other type of early Permian animal. The eight front teeth are spatulate and peg-like, and served as incisors that were used to nip off mouthfuls of vegetation. These traits are likely adaptations related to the animal's high-fiber, herbivorous diet, and evolved independently of similar traits seen in some reptilian groups. Many of the reptile-like details of the postcranial skeleton are possibly related to carrying the substantial trunk, these may be independently derived traits on diadects and their relatives. Diasporactus also had powerful jaws, chisel-like front teeth, and grinding cheek teeth, and they grew to relatively large sizes for their time with bulky bodies supporting voluminous plant-fermenting guts. It was only about half the size of its largest relatives, but it's notable for having unusually high neural spines on its vertebrae, not quite long enough to be considered a sail, but more of a high back that may have supported powerful musculature or fatty deposits. Westlothiana had a long slender body with relatively small legs, which may have been adaptations for burrowing similar to modern skinks. Its anatomy shows a mixture of both amphibian and reptilian characteristics, suggesting it may have been a close relative of the first true amniotes. But exactly where it fits in that area of the evolutionary tree is still uncertain, with different paleontologists classifying it as either an early amniote. Jormungandr had a long streamlined tubular body with small limbs and a short tapering tail, and a stubby snout with fused bones heavily reinforcing its skull. 
along with microscopic ridges on its body scales that resemble the dirt-repelling scales of some modern reptiles, this combination of features suggest it was a head-first burrower that wriggled its way through soil with snake-like motions. Pantelis was probably capable of burrowing, using its shovel-like snout and strong forelimbs to dig headfirst into the ground in a similar manner to the modern turtle frog. Its teeth were blunt and conical, adapted for grinding and crushing tough food, and in some specimens were worn down to stubs from heavy use. It most likely ate hard-shelled invertebrates, but there's also a small possibility that it was at least semi-herbivorous, something highly unusual among amphibians. The exact evolutionary relationships between the earliest amphibians and amniotes are rather murky, and the recently discovered Diabloridor is a member of a group in the middle of this uncertain classification. It was part of a lineage known as the Recumbarostrans, small burrowing aquatic salamander-like creatures, many of which had elongated bodies and short tails. Some paleontologists suggest it may have been herbivorous, making it one of the earliest known plant-eating tetrapods, with teeth adapted for scraping at algae-covered surfaces and a rather rotund body that would have housed a large gut region. Hyloplesion was a member of a diverse group of lepospondyls known as microsaurs. These small amphibians were once classified in their own unique order, but are now considered to be paraphyletic with the name instead being used as a collective term for their evolutionary grade. It probably had a semi-aquatic lifestyle, since its body shape was adapted for swimming but its limbs were still well developed enough to support itself on land. Microbrachis was an elongated, salamander-like creature, about 15 centimeters long, with over 40 vertebrae instead of the average 15 to 26 in its living relatives. It had minute limbs, and probably swam using fish-like lateral body movements. It probably fed on freshwater plankton such as shrimp. It was pedomorphic, retaining its larval gills in adulthood. Similar traits are found in the extant axolotl. Brachydectes is one of the best-known lycerophians, represented by a good amount of fossil material compared to many of its relatives. Its wide shovel-shaped snout and thickened reinforced bones around its brain case suggest it was adapted for head-first digging, and some specimens have actually been found preserved inside their burrows. The roof of its skull also developed extensive sculpturing as individuals aged, with juveniles having smooth bone surfaces and larger adults having a distinct rough bumpy texture. Lysorophus was a fully aquatic animal with an eel-like body and highly reduced limbs, growing up to about 30 centimeters long. Although often considered to be relatives of the microsaurs, Lysorophians may actually have been much closer to the isopods, and are one of the possible candidates for closest known relatives of living amphibians. Some fossil specimens are found tightly coiled up, each inside an individual burrow, and this has been interpreted as estivation behavior during dry seasons. Caraturpidon had a broad short snout head with eyes set far forward, and a pair of backwards pointing bony horns at the back of its skull. Its forelimbs were smaller than its hind limbs, and unlike most other diplocolids it had five fingers on its hands instead of four. Its vertically flattened paddle-like tail was also around twice as long as the rest of its body, and was probably its main source of propulsion in the water. It seems to have been quite numerous in the coal swamps it inhabited, representing the most common species preserved in the Irish Jero assemblage site. Diplocolis was one of the largest lepospondyls, reaching around 1 meter long with the largest specimen skulls measuring up to 40 centimeters wide. Although most reconstructions tend to depict it as a shrink-wrapped hammerhead salamander, fossil body imprints suggest that it actually had flaps of skin connecting the outer tips to its body, which would have given it much more of a stingray sort of shape. The function of its weird head shape is still unknown, 
although there are plenty of hypotheses. It may have acted as a hydrofoil for more efficient swimming, or been used to root through muddy riverbeds for prey, or it may have simply made Diplocolis too wide for some larger predators to easily swallow. Flegethoncha had a very lightly built skull with many of the bones reduced to a series of supporting struts. This has sometimes been interpreted as evidence of snake-like cranial kinesis, but since Flegethoncha's skull structure actually seems to have been quite rigid this is unlikely to have been the case. Unlike snakes, whose body is mostly made up of an extended thorax with only a short amount of actual tail, istopods were built much more like their close relative urocordylus about two-thirds of their length was tail vertebrae, similar in proportion to modern glass lizards. Lithiscus was already a very specialized animal despite its basal position among the istopods, with eyes set far forward on its face and no trace of vestigial limbs. Scans of its skull have shown some surprisingly fish-like anatomy, especially in its brain case, features that were lost very early in tetrapod evolution. This suggests that istopods weren't part of the lepospondyl amphibians like previously thought, but actually originated much, much earlier in the tetrapod evolutionary tree.